Greetings, this is Greg. I've been asked by some Patreon supporters to post a video about John Boyd's tactics and his energy maneuverability theory. John Boyd was a U.S. Air Force fighter pilot. He flew 22 missions in Korea, piloting the F-86 Sabre. He never once fired his guns in combat. After Korea, he became an instructor at the Air Force Weapons School, and this is where our story really begins. Boyd became known as 42nd Boyd because he had a standing bet that anyone could start behind him in a dogfight and within 40 seconds he would reverse the situation and be behind his adversary. Apparently, no one ever collected on the bet. Boyd won every time. Prior to John Boyd, the Air Force and most fighter pilots felt that air-to-air -air combat was too complex and too fluid to be broken down into a series of moves and counter moves. Generally speaking, fighter pilots followed a loose set of tactics or rules, such as the dicta bulke, but nobody really had a move-by-move -move list for fighter pilots once they found themselves in a one-on-one -on -one fight. John Boyd changed that forever. He believed, and correctly so, that fighter planes operate within a world limited by physics, the airplane itself has limits, the pilots have limits, and there's a finite amount of space the plane operates in. Thus, at a given speed, an F-100 Super Saber is going to be limited to some maximum turn rate or pitch angle. Even if it's going fast enough to pull up into the vertical, its time at that angle will be limited by the realities of thrust, weight, and gravity. Boyd spent a lot of his own off-duty time in 1959 and 1960 sitting at his typewriter and putting down the groundwork for what would become his aerial attack study. He had no budget, no official orders to do this, he just did it, and it became what was effectively the Bible of air-to-air -air combat for the U.S. Air Force, at least through the Vietnam War. Let's take a look at a paragraph in this book dealing with the thought that air-to-air -air combat is too complex to be codified. Pause if you want to read the actual text, but I'll summarize it. Boyd believes that the options in air-to-air -air combat are within a finite range and field of maneuvering, and knowledge of these limitations can be used to gain advantage over one's adversary. Here's the field of maneuvering Boyd described. The plane's field is limited by its turn rate, climb rate, and other factors. The elongated lower section is caused by the pull of gravity. Let's get into the actual maneuvers and counter maneuvers. We can't go over every single combo in Boyd's book, but we'll take a look at this, some of the common situations that he covers. A typical fighter attack is from nearly dead astern. This was typical in real life, and a review of in-game footage from online flight sims shows this is the most common type of kill in air-to-air -air combat, so it's where we'll start. All of this footage is courtesy of the iFly Central YouTube channel. I'll link the full videos in the description. So here we have a typical stern attack. Central's piloting an FW-190A8 and he's closing in on AP-38 Lightning. He's staying low 6 to remain in the Lightning pilot's blind spot and most likely the lightning pilot's not going to see him in time. This is a typical kill that you see in online multiplayer stuff. Once the 190's in range, unloads with everything he's got, and that's the end of that P-38. Again, this is a very typical type of kill in online multiplayer action. How should a defender counter the stern attack? Our knowledge of aircraft turn performance tells us that with two similar airplanes, the defending airplane in this case, we'll be moving slower, and thus we'll be able to turn more tightly. A sudden turn here by the defender, if tight enough and if timed correctly, would make it almost impossible for Central to get the shot because his faster moving plane won't be able to match the turn. So in most cases, the defender's first counter should be a hard break turn, which Boyd calls a defensive turn. This is a defense against either a gun attack or a missile launch. It's important to note that depending on the attacker's position, it could be a turn with a vertical component or just a hard horizontal turn. Ideally, the defender wants to turn just hard enough to prevent the attacker's firing solution, but not any harder so as not to lose too much energy. 
Of course, for every move, there's a counter move, so let's look at the counter to the brake turn. The most common counter for the brake turn is the high speed yo yo. For this counter, once the defender starts his brake turn, the attacker will turn outside of the defender's turn and climb. This does several things. First, it's hard for the defender to keep track of the attacker during this maneuver. If the defender loses situational awareness, he'll be at a severe disadvantage. Second, it allows the attacker to slow, thus preventing over an overshoot and allowing for a tighter turn and retention of energy because of the vertical component. If timed correctly, the attacker will get a shot at the bottom of the yo-yo. Let's go back to a central video to see this in action. Keep in mind the resolution on Central's channel is better than what you'll see here. Now Central flies with a very strong crew. One of his squad mates will actually get some shots in on the target here before Central finishes him off. So what we see here is Central in an FW-190 rolling in and diving onto the rear quarter of an LA-5. And as he comes in, the LA-5 makes a pretty hard turn to the left and Central's 190 cannot keep up with that. So he's going into a high yo-yo here. And as he's on the downhill side, one of his wingmen gets a shot in on the LA-5. Now the LA-5's low, slow, out of energy, and Central's in perfect firing position and finishes him off. So that's a very typical high yo-yo maneuver uh, counter to a hard brake turn. That one went pretty well. They don't always go quite that smoothly. Among the top sim pilots in the IL-2 world, the high-speed yo-yo is a very common counter to the brake turn. Not only do I see Central do this all the time in his videos, I see similar tactics from the Sheriff on the Sheriff Sim Shack YouTube channel. Interestingly, the Sheriff has his own particular version of this move, in which he elongates it out and retains energy and altitude longer before he comes back in for the attack. It's less aggressive, but safer. If he doesn't like what he sees, he just doesn't do the last half of the yo-yo. He just keeps on going. So, let's move on. What's the defender's counter for the high-speed yo-yo? It's a well-timed turn back in the opposite direction. There's quite a bit of text describing just how to do this, and it's tricky to pull off, but the gist of it is this. Once your attacker is in the climb, relax the G-loading to save energy and enter a shallow descent. When the attacker is in the downhill portion, turn into him hard. Even if you don't get a shot, you'll have an opportunity for separation as your paths cross. So let's take a look at the counter to the high-speed yo-yo in action. This time, Central's 190 is going to be diving on a P-40, which is flown by a fairly wily competitor, and he does a great job defending. So here Central is diving in on the P-40. The P-40 is a little more maneuverable than the 190, plus the 190 is moving faster, so the P-40's brake turn will be pretty effective. Although he starts it a hair late, so Central's still able to get some bullets on target, and then starts the high yo-yo a little bit late. That enables the defender to cut back to the inside and, and Central can't complete the yo-yo. So he wisely just continues to climb, saves his energy, and comes back around for another pass. The failure of the yo-yo in this case was due to the late start, but the trade-off was that Central got bullets on target, so it was really a wise decision. Now he's coming back in and we'll see if the P-40 pilot makes the same mistake, which is starting the brake turn a little bit late. And it looks like he does, but again, he gets the brake turn in, and Central's yo-yo is getting countered by this guy turning back the other direction. So Central goes to the right, possibly come back down in on him, but then this guy exactly corrects for this and, and turns back into him, even gets some shots, and does a pretty good job. Uh, that guy should get a medal for countering two attacks like that. He didn't get a medal, he got shot down because Requiem, another guy who has a YouTube channel about dogfighting, um, came in and finished him off. But uh, in any case, hats off to the P-40 pilot. He did a pretty good job there with what he had to work with. I think that's about enough for the specifics. It would take forever to go through all the scenarios in the book, and we have other fish to fry here. Before we move on, I want to address two points of criticism I often hear. 
First, some people have the impression that Boyd was taking Pilate's skill out of dogfighting by trying to codify procedures. That's not true. Most of these moves take a great deal of skill to perform and good judgment for timing. As an example, the simple defensive turn requires very good timing to work. Too late, your enemy gets a shot in anyway. Too early, you don't generate the needed angle to avoid him getting the shot. There are many times in his writings when Boyd mentions the importance of pilot skill. The other criticism I hear is that Boyd didn't really invent anything here. All of these moves were known to fighter pilots for decades, and that's true. I've read numerous case of, cases of World War II pilots having pre-planned moves and going through scenarios so that when they happened, they wouldn't have to think much because they had mentally been there before. However, that's not quite the same thing. The difference here is that Boyd wrote it all down, and his writings on this are extensive. This book covers fighter versus fighter, guns versus missiles, fighter versus bomber, and not just one-on-one, -on -one, but all types of situations. He was the first to really try to codify all of this, and his methods were proven at the Air Force Weapons School and became Air Force Doctrine. Now we have to talk about the OODA loop, or OODA loop. This is often misunderstood, usually by non-aviation types trying to apply it to other situations. It certainly can be applied to other situations. It's often used in law enforcement, and it's taught in business and some other things as well. OODA stands for Observe, Orient, Decide, Act. Let's break that down from a dogfighting perspective. You're in your P-51 and you observe an enemy BF-109 below and in front of you. You orient yourself, meaning you evaluate what your plane can do in this moment and what the enemy plane is capable of doing and likely to do. In this case, you decide that the enemy is most likely to continue to fly straight ahead, and you know that in a shallow dive your P-51 can easily close the distance into gun range. Next, you decide to enter a dive and close in. Next, you enter the dive and try to get into gun range. That's the act part. Now, it's back to the start. You're observing, watching that 109 for any changes to the situation. You're taking in the information not only about the enemy plane, but about your plane as well and the environment around you. Any new information will cause you to have to reorient yourself. Now, the 109 pilot detects you, and just before you can open fire, he breaks hard to the right. That observation causes you to reorient yourself. You can't turn with him because you're going too fast. However, your knowledge of the 109's limitations and of your own tell you that he's lost a lot of energy in that brake turn, and that you can high yo-yo in and slot in behind him, and you do so. So you observed the break, oriented yourself, decided, and acted. Thus have now gone through your OODA loop a second time. The 109 pilot has gone through the loop once, which resulted in his break turn. During the turn, he started his second loop, but likely got stuck in the observed phase of the second loop because it's hard to keep track of an enemy in this specific situation. Let's say he did, and let's say he recognizes the high yo-yo maneuver. He's still mentally behind because he's going to be in the orientation phase of his second loop while you're in the action phase of your second loop. You are driving the encounter. As the fight progresses, the person going through the OODA loop faster will be at an advantage because he'll be forcing the other person to react and thus dictating the fight. The OODA loop is not a new way of thinking. It is the way people think during hostile or competitive encounters. Dogfight, fistfight, game of chess, doesn't matter. It's the way people think. What Boyd was doing here was coming up with a way to explain the way pilots think in a dogfight and explain how going through the loop faster than your enemy leads to an advantage. The most critical part of the loop is the orientation phase. It's very important to have a good assessment of what maneuvers your enemy can and can't perform at the given moment. For example, if I'm up against a P-47 and I can see that he's doing about 200 miles per hour, I know he can't pull up into an Immelman. That's going to factor into my decision on how to act. Once oriented, 
I don't want to spend a lot of time deciding how to act because I want to go through the loop quickly. Thus, the understanding of the moves and counter moves saves time here and gets you through the loop faster than the other guy, hopefully. I think that's enough about the OODA loop. It's really not that complicated, uh, but some people seem to make it that way. So far, we've been dealing with airplanes that are at least similar in performance with each other, sometimes identical. The aerial attack study was written based on an F-100 versus another F-100. What happens when one plane is so much more maneuverable that moves and counter moves just don't work as reliably? For example, what if the enemy plane is so superior that it can stay with your brake turn in spite of some extra speed? Well, this is exactly the situation the U.S. Air Force found itself in over Vietnam with the F-4 Phantom. The F-4 Phantom was among the first of a new generation of jet fighters. It was built with a strong focus on beyond visual range fighting with its radar guided missiles for longer range attacks and heat seekers for work in closer. Initially, there were some reliability problems with the missiles, but they were worked out and the Phantom's air-to-air -air missile system was effective. However, the U.S. Air Force's rules of engagement over Vietnam prohibited launching a missile against an enemy aircraft unless it was first visually identified. This put the F-4 at a huge disadvantage. The entire plane was built around the concept of a powerful radar system and out-of-visual-range missile launches. The F-4 was not really intended to engage in turn-and-burn old-style dogfights. It's not that it couldn't, but it wasn't a design priority. Now, the Air Force had other fighters that were more suited to that type of dogfight. However, most, like the F-5 here, just didn't have the range or time on station to perform the missions needed in Vietnam. They were built to defend countries like the Netherlands, where you can take off and see border to border. Thus, the Air Force was stuck using the F-4 in exactly the type of fight for which it was ill-suited. It was going up against various types of MiGs, the most threatening of which was the MiG-21. A new tactic was needed, one that would allow the F-4 to dogfight with the MiG-21. This was a tall order, nearly impossible, and the Air Force called in John Boyd. This resulted in the now famous Energy Maneuverability Study. Boyd teamed up with a sharp lieutenant and an expert in mathematics, and the three of them built upon some earlier work by others. To understand what they're up against, take a look at these charts from the study. At 30,000 feet, and at any airspeed, the MiG badly outturns the Phantom. For example, at 300 knots calibrated, that's around 500 knots true, the MiG can pull into a 5GG turn, the F-4 about 2.7G, so it's not even close. The answer, or at least the best they could come up with, was in energy fighting. Aircraft-specific energy is a bit hard to understand. It's the combination of the kinetic and potential energy of the aircraft at any given time. An aircraft sitting on the ground has zero energy. It's not moving and has no altitude to exchange for speed. An aircraft maneuvering hard in a flight tends to lose altitude and speed over the course of the battle. Thus, it loses energy. If it ends up low and slow on the deck, it's very low on energy and very vulnerable. Thus, having more energy at the start of the fight can give one airplane an advantage, or alternatively, if one airplane can conserve energy more, or gain energy more, effectively, without getting shot down, eventually, that aircraft will have the advantage. Even the amount of fuel the plane has is a factor here. When in afterburner, fighters go through fuel really fast. The plane with more fuel in terms of time may be able to stay in afterburner longer, thus have an energy advantage due to time. Don't underestimate this factor. An F-4 with full internal fuel will burn all of its fuel at sea level in about eight minutes when in full afterburner. So here is what Boyd came up with. A formula which sums up a fighter's capability at a given speed in terms of energy maneuverability. It's called the energy maneuverability theory. This is the formula. By using this formula to calculate the energy state of aircraft at various speeds and altitudes, he could create and overlay charts which show where one plane would have an advantage 
over another in terms of energy maneuverability. The report is long and deals with a lot of complex math that few of us could follow. The summary is that the MiG-21 has a maneuvering advantage over the F-4 almost everywhere in the flight envelope. The F-4 has a slight maneuvering advantage in terms of efficiency. That means that during a sustained fight, the F-4 will use a lower percentage of its internal fuel for a given amount of time. This isn't much of an advantage, but it does mean that time is on the F-4 side. If the F-4 can stay out of the MiG's firing arc, the MiG will be low on fuel first. The only advantage the F-4 has, or at least really solid advantage, is in its ability to fire first, but that advantage was taken away by the rules of engagement over Vietnam. So this looks really bad for the F-4. In order to even the fight a bit, the F-4 will need to enter the fight with an energy advantage. If he knows the fight is coming, he should build up speed or altitude or some combination of both. Boyd calculated the correct path to fly to build up energy and gain an advantage. The math involved is way beyond my low-level algebra, as is most of the math on this subject. To simplify it for pilots, he came up with a rule of thumb. During subsonic flight, climb the F-4 at a constant Mach number. Looks like it's about Mach 0.83, up to about 20,000 feet. From there, fly a constant calibrated airspeed, allowing the Mach number to increase. That'll give you the most amount of energy for a given amount of time. Now, there's also a different path to fly if you're trying to gain the most amount of energy for a given amount of fuel you have on board. Now, there's a lot more of these subjects than I'm covering here today. I'm just showing you guys the tip of the iceberg here. But hopefully it's enough to get a basic understanding of the contributions uh, John Boyd made to air-to-air -air combat. As always, links to these manuals are in the description should you wish to do further research. I'll add that John Boyd is also credited with uh, being the architect of a lot of the strategy the U.S. used in the first Gulf War, and uh, his ultimate answer to the problem of the MiG was to build a better airplane, and his theories and contributions were instrumental in development of the F-15, F-16, and F-18. That's all for now. Have a great day.